three graphite electrodes, each as thick as a telephone pole, descend into a vessel filled with crushed cars and demolished buildings. 100 megawatts of electricity, enough to power 80,000 homes, courses through them. Then, contact. Plasma arcs erupt at 3,500 degrees Celsius, hotter than the surface of the sun. In the next 90 minutes, 200 tons of scrap metal will liquefy into glowing orange steel. This is the electric arc furnace, and you're about to witness something incredible. Look up at any skyscraper, walk through any modern bridge, enter any industrial warehouse. What holds these massive structures together? Steel I-beams the backbone of modern construction. However, what most people don't realize is that the beams supporting thousands of tons above our heads often began their lives as old cars, demolished buildings, discarded appliances, and industrial waste. Today, we're taking you inside one of the most impressive industrial operations on Earth. In this large-scale steel factory, Mountains of scrap metal are transformed into precision-engineered structural steel. This is the complete story of I-beam manufacturing through electric arc furnace steelmaking. Welcome to the modern age of steel recycling. Our journey begins not in the steel mill itself, but in the sprawling scrapyard often covering 50 to 100 acres, where steel's circular economy comes to life. This is where the old becomes new again. Every day, hundreds of trucks arrive carrying scrap metal from every imaginable source. Demolished building steel, old railroad tracks, crushed automobiles, manufacturing offcuts, used appliances, industrial machinery. Each type of scrap has different characteristics, and managing this diversity is the first challenge of modern steelmaking. The scrap is sorted into categories based on quality and composition. Number one heavy melting scrap. Thick, clean steel plate at least a quarter inch thick. Number two scrap, lighter gauge materials. Shredded scrap from automobiles. Bundle scrap that's been compressed. High grade scrap from manufacturing operations with known composition. Each category has different melting characteristics and different values. Before scrap can enter the furnace, it must be processed. This is where some truly massive machinery comes into play. First, there's the shredder, a machine that can reduce an entire automobile to fist-sized pieces in less than a minute. The automotive shredder is an engineering marvel. At its heart is a massive rotor, typically 6 to 10 feet in diameter, spinning at 400 to 500 RPM. This rotor is equipped with dozens of swing hammers, each weighing 100 to 200 pounds. These hammers strike the incoming scrap with tremendous force. We're talking about impact energies that can exceed 5,000 horsepower. The shredded material falls through grates and moves along a conveyor system where it's separated. Powerful electromagnets, some generating magnetic fields of 20,000 gauss or more, extract ferrous metals. Eddy current separators spin rapidly, generating opposing magnetic fields that literally throw non-ferrous metals like aluminum and copper away from the steel. Air classification systems blow away lighter materials like plastics and foam. For larger pieces of scrap, the yard employs massive hydraulic shears. These machines can generate cutting forces exceeding 2,000 tons, enough to slice through steel plates several inches thick like it's paper. The shear blades, made from hardened tool steel, are typically 8 to 12 feet long and work like giant scissors, making clean cuts through structural steel, pipes, and beams.
Moving scrap around the yard requires specialized equipment. Orange peel grapples, so named because they open and close like peeling an orange, can grab and lift 10 to 15 tons of scrap in a single bite. These grapples hang from massive overhead cranes or are mounted on mobile excavators with boom reaches of 60 feet or more. Electromagnets mounted on cranes can lift 5 to 10 tons of ferrous scrap at once. When energized with DC power, often 220 to 440 volts at hundreds of amps, these magnets can pick up and hold steel that would be impossible to grab mechanically. The crane operator can release the load instantly by cutting power. For the most efficient operations, the scrapyard uses charging buckets, massive steel containers that can hold 20 to 40 tons of prepared scrap. These buckets are carefully loaded with a mix of scrap types to achieve the desired chemistry, then transported to the melt shop where they'll be charged directly into the furnace. Now we enter the melt shop, the thundering heart of the steel mill. This is where scrap metal is transformed back into liquid steel through one of the most intense industrial processes ever developed, electric arc furnace steel making. The electric arc furnace, or EAF, is a vessel that looks deceptively simple from the outside, but represents the pinnacle of metallurgical engineering. Modern EAFs used for structural steel production typically have capacities ranging from 100 to 300 tons of steel per heat. That's 200,000 to 600,000 pounds of metal melted in a single batch. The furnace shell is constructed from heavy steel plate, often two to three inches thick, formed into a cylindrical shape with a spherical bottom. But the steel shell isn't exposed to the molten metal. Inside, the furnace is lined with refractory materials that can withstand temperatures exceeding 1800 degrees Celsius. That's 3272 degrees Fahrenheit. The refractory lining consists of multiple layers. The hot face, the part in direct contact with molten steel, uses magnesia carbon bricks, or basic refractory materials. These bricks are typically 9 inches thick and are carefully laid in patterns that allow for thermal expansion. Behind this, insulating refractory layers protect the steel shell and reduce heat loss. A complete reline of an EAF can require 200 to 400 tons of refractory material. The defining feature of an electric arc furnace is its electrode system. Three massive graphite electrodes, 24 to 30 inches in diameter, that descend through the roof. These electrodes are powered by 80 to 120 megawatts, enough electricity to power a small city, stepped down from 100,000 volts to 400 to 1,200 volts, but at massive current, 40,000 to 100,000 amperes per phase. The melting cycle begins with the roof swinging open. An overhead crane drops 100 to 200 tons of scrap into the vessel with a tremendous crash. The roof closes, electrodes descend, and when power is applied, plasma arcs erupt at 3,500 degrees Celsius. The sound is deafening, the light is blinding. This is raw industrial power. The electrodes bore down through the scrap pile like hot knives through butter. As scrap melts, upper layers collapse, and the electrodes continue descending. Oxy-fuel burners in the furnace walls, each producing 10 to 20 million BTU per hour, supplement the electrical heating. In 45 to 90 minutes, solid scrap becomes liquid steel at 1600 degrees Celsius. Once melted, we have molten steel at 1600 degrees Celsius, but the chemistry must be perfected. 
An operator extends a sampling lance and withdraws a sample. Within 60 seconds, an optical emission spectrometer analyzes the exact percentages of carbon, manganese, phosphorus, sulfur, and other elements. Based on this analysis, ferro-alloys are added to hit precise specifications. Slag, a glassy layer of impurities, is removed by tilting the furnace with hydraulic cylinders. The slag flows through a water-cooled slag door into waiting pots. Then comes tapping. An oxygen lance burns through the tap hole plug, and molten steel streams into a massive ladle a refractory-lined vessel holding 100 to 300 tons. As steel flows, deoxidizers like aluminum are added, and calcium wire is injected to modify inclusions. The entire tap takes 5 to 8 minutes. The ladle then travels to the ladle metallurgy station, where argon bubbles through the steel, homogenizing temperature and chemistry. Wire feeding systems make final adjustments with incredible precision. The ladle travels to the continuous caster, where liquid becomes solid. The ladle's sliding gate opens, pouring steel into the tundish, an intermediate vessel holding 20 to 40 tons that distributes steel evenly to the casting machine. Steel flows through a submerged nozzle into a water-cooled copper mold, 280 to 400 millimeters square, that's oscillating 60 to 200 times per minute. Water flowing at 300 to 500 gallons per minute through the mold cools the steel so rapidly that a solid shell forms in seconds. But here's the key. Only the outer shell solidifies. The center remains liquid. The partially solid strand is continuously pulled downward by withdrawal rolls at 0.8 to 1.2 meters per minute. Below the mold, spray nozzles in multiple zones continue cooling. The strand curves from vertical to horizontal over an 8 to 12 meter radius. Complete solidification occurs 15 to 20 meters below the mold. Traveling oxy-fuel torches cut the continuous strand into 6 to 12 meter blooms while it moves. Each bloom is stamped with identification codes and sent to the rolling mill. Blooms enter the reheat furnace, a 30 to 50 meter tunnel that raises steel temperature to 1200, 1250 degrees Celsius over two to four hours. Multiple burner zones ensure even heating throughout. The glowing orange bloom then hits the roughing mill Massive rolling stands with cylinders weighing 5 to 20 tons, driven by motors producing 2,000 to 5,000 horsepower. Rolling forces exceed 2,000 tons, 4 million pounds of squeezing force. The steel deforms plastically, flowing like hot taffy. Through four to eight passes, the bloom is squeezed and elongated. Next come intermediate mills where roll grooves begin forming the web and flange profile. Then the finishing mill, the heart of the operation. Universal beam mills use both horizontal and vertical rolls working together.
Horizontal rolls form the web and inside flange surfaces. Vertical edger rolls form the outside flange surfaces and control the width. All four rolls squeeze simultaneously, creating the precise I-beam shape. The rolling is continuous. Steel enters as a bloom and exits as a long I-beam at speeds reaching 8 to 15 meters per second. The entire rolling sequence takes just 60 to 90 seconds. Hot beams enter cooling beds, then pass through straightening presses, where hydraulic equipment corrects any bowing. High-speed circular saws with carbide-tipped blades cut beams to length. Finally, automatic marking systems stamp size, grade, and heat number. The beams are bundled and loaded for shipment. And there you have it, the complete journey from scrap metal to structural I-beams. The next time you see a skyscraper rising or drive across a steel bridge, remember, you're witnessing the culmination of one of humanity's most impressive industrial achievements. A process that transforms yesterday's waste into tomorrow's infrastructure through controlled application of massive force, extreme temperature, and engineering precision. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this look inside large-scale steel manufacturing, please like this video and subscribe for more documentary content exploring the amazing world of heavy industry.